Piano on air. That on air side, <coughs> Neil, is not connect. This isn't like fantastic, and it's not connected to the record button. I have to hit the record button, then I plug that in. A USB. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it looks cool. I mean, no, it does. It looks it's not really even cool. on camera. For people, for people listening or watching, it doesn't matter if you listen or watching. I've got an on air, a neon on air sign that um, Simon Piles gave me. Actually, thank you, Simon. And uh, it's, it, I use it to let the guests know that we're on air. But I always say we're recording, and then I plug it in because it's not got a switch. Anyway, I'll rectify that. It looks good though. <laughs> Neil Woods, <coughs> pleasure to have you in the studio. We've been trying to arrange this since I don't know some point <coughs> last year. Bit of a delay, but gave me a chance to read your book, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Thoroughly enjoyed, changed my perception, perspective, and opinion on a lot of things. And um, and uh, and here you are, icebreaker, right? Yeah. Before we get into everything else, so uh, uh, icebreaker, you described yourself as an activist. Yes. What do you, what would you call what would define activist for me? <laughs> An activist is somebody who dedicates their time and energies to a particular cause to, in order to influence or change opinion or the political situation. And what makes somebody an activist, as opposed to somebody who's just politically interested and puts some of their time into those interests, is the fact that it is my entire reason for being. It is, I don't... Um, approach life as uh, earning money to pay my way to pay the bills to look after my family that becomes a secondary issue because i am not putting my own financial well-being at the at the top of the list the top of my list is my activism is what i do to try and change the political situation so that's what defines me as an activist so the thing that consumes most of most of your time as um, um, as a, an, of an activist time as you would define it is whatever cause they're, they're looking to support, right? Yeah, it, it, I see it as my vocation, it's my job. Yeah. So I am a full-time yeah. activist. I am not, it's, not my sec, it's not my second job. I don't have a day job. This is me. Okay, and so with the activism, is it purely focused on uh, the drugs issue that we will come on to, or is it uh, an activist for anything that, that uh, sort of takes your fancy? No, no, I'm a single issue activist because that's where my knowledge and expertise is and it's what my passion is having said that i'm an activist about drug law reform the need to change our drug laws that has um implications and complications to the rest of society <coughs> you know it impacts on all all so many different aspects of our lives that sometimes i do also campaign on overlapping issues where i think it's appropriate mm. The reason I asked about the definition is because from from my experience and just watching things and people and you probably you'll probably I think you'll have, I think you'll agree on this maybe I don't know but uh, is that you can get people who will describe themselves as activists but they're not as they they're not as committed to a particular cause as, as you are you know with, with you your experience in the police and your experience of society and, and 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 drug impact on society has brought about this I'm assuming this motivation to become an activist in this this single issue you know the single issue drug uh, drug law reform and, and and drugs right um but there are people I've seen who they will they will call themselves an activist, but just to have the labels of, of an activist, they're not particularly really emotionally tied to any one cause. They're just there to be. This is the kind of person I am, and and that's what who I'm going to be going forward. Which I think I think I think I don't think that's a good thing because if you're going to have people fighting for causes issues, be an activist about it, you really want them <laughs> believing and like knowledgeable about what they're talking about, really believing in what they're talking about, and and have become activists because of that and not vice versa. Make sense? Am I making sense? Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Um, and you do need to trust people's motivations in order to invest in what they're saying, I, I believe. I mean, you, you know, there are party political activists, people who are activists just in support of a political party. But but there's always a trade-off with that because that's is that actually driven by their experience and passion on the topic? I'm, I'm not knocking those people, but... I'm strictly non-partisan. I have very good allies in the Conservative Party. I have very good allies in the Labour Party and the Greens and the Lib Dems and all in between. M my issue is cross-party, non-partisan. So, what's the issue? 
Well, the issue is the need to change our drug laws because international and national drug prohibition has been and is being catastrophic. It's catastrophic because it's killing people and from a policing perspective, it's making organised crime powerful. Organised crime was birthed by drug prohibition. That's why it exists. That's where it started. And it is what now makes international organised crime incredibly powerful. The Global Initiative into Transnational Organised Crime, sometimes referred to as GITOC, is an international crime agency. And 14 months ago, they published a report which stated that the growing power of transnational organised crime is the single biggest threat to our democratic way of life and our security. Within that report, they called for a global reset of drug policy. That's a common term at the moment, isn't it? The old global reset. Well, that was as far as they can go because they're actually funded by the UN United Nations Office in Drugs and Crime. So how they got that phrase through on that report, I've no idea. But the, the evidence is massive that the money from the illicit drugs market is empowering the very worst elements of our society in every nation. This is causing violence in our communities. It's corrupting entire nations. It's a disaster. And what we need to do is to take control, take control away from criminals. Can we, can we come back to the, the origin of serious organised crime related to, to, to uh, the prohibition of drugs? So mm. can, we, can you talk about that historically? Explain that to me. Yeah, so people, people think that our drug laws are about the harms of drugs. They're not at all. They're actually um, a hangover from American domestic racism. So the drug laws, uh, all of our drug policy was dictated to the rest of the world by the United States. We used to have an opposing view of drug policy, which was called the British system. And that was, di that was designed by Britain. And there were these two ideological differences between the American way, which was um, seeing it as a moral judgment, the need to criminalise anyone who got addicted to drugs. And then there was the British system, which saw addiction as a um, an unfortunate medical condition, which you just give someone care for. So what it meant in the British system was that if you, had, if you developed an addiction to heroin, under the British system, you'd go to a doctor and the doctor would give you a prescription and you'd have heroin on prescription. <laughs> And as a result of that, we didn't have a drug problem in Britain at all. There were times through the 1920s, 30s, 40s and 50s where we were measuring our numbers of heroin addicted people in the hundreds. In America, they had hundreds of thousands, close to a million. This was the opposing impacts of the two systems. Now, I apologize. It's a very long answer to your question. I apologize. I need to get a notebook, but one second. Keep, keep talking. Go on. Because I've, I've, this question's popping up my head. I write that down because you'll forget. Write that down you'll forget. I'm going to grab a notebook. Go on. Keep talking. I'm listening. So we had these two comparative systems, but that, and, and the British system was incredibly successful. And then the, then the Second World War happened. And that made America the true superpower because everyone owed America the money af afterwards. We only actually paid our World War I debt to America in 2015, let alone our, Amer our World War II debt. But this meant that America had enormous power to make people follow their way of doing things. And one of, one of those big examples of that is international drug policy. That's why we all now have American drug policy. <coughs> But why did America have this punitive, moral judgment drug policy? And that was because of their... Cannabis. Racism. Their racism. So, opium was only banned because America imported Chinese workers to build the railroads. When the railroads had been finished, you got a load of Chinese immigrants looking for jobs. So they were then persecuted and criminalised for what was seen as part of their behaviour, which was the consumption of opium. Black people were persecuted by banning <coughs> cocaine because of the, after the Civil War ended, you'd got the southern states still wanting to criminalise black people and maintain the system of slavery, incarceration of black people. And banning cocaine was one way of doing this, and that's why it was done. Why was that one way of doing it? Was so cocaine was... Explain the cocaine well, use then. Well, the, cocaine, the was, cocaine was used by all sorts of people. It's in tonics and drinks. It's just a tonic. It was an alternative. It was, it was seen by some people as an alternative, uh, an alternative, healthy alternative to alcohol. But 
it was also seen in the South as a way of criminalising black people because they wanted to increase the... Put people black, black people in prison, OK? Couldn't enslave them anymore. Put them in prison, then they're working for nothing and you continue the enslavement of black people. But if... Sorry, I'm trying to wrap my head around. This is, I hadn't heard this before about the cocaine. So if cocaine was in widespread use in America, right, not just amongst the black community, but and white community, and it was just ingredients and different things. I mean, Coca-Cola is a famous one, right? Then how through banning that would it only target black people? Because it was a political tool that, that could be used to target black people. I mean, even now in, in drug policy in the UK... If you're black, you're 10 times more likely to be stopped searched for drugs than if you're white. In the States, it's the same. Racism is in the DNA of our drug policy. That's not necessarily just down to racism, though, is it? Well, it, well, it is, because black people don't use the drugs more than white people. There is no other reason for it. And it becomes self-perpetuating, because then if you criminalise a certain section of your community, then you've reduced their, um, their ability to thrive in that community because they've been criminalised and you've got a sort of cumulative effect which grows over time. But the origins of it were back in the States. So you mentioned cannabis. They used to call it cannabis in North America, but when during the, during the, the Great Depression you had um, Spanish workers looking for white jobs, what were seen as white jobs, Spanish people were criminalised. And what they saw as a more of a, a South American habit, the use of cannabis, even though it was used in medicines for white people. You know, you, the, the, the white people who were using cannabis was perhaps the, uh, the middle-aged mother who was using it for various, um, treat various pain problems or whatever it was. As soon as it was used as a tool to persecute um, Latin American people, they changed the name. They called it marijuana to make it sound more exotic and more foreign. And that's why cannabis was persecuted as a criminal endeavour. It was about those other people. Even alcohol prohibition was about immigration. Even that. Because the white Puritan power base, very, very Protestant power base, saw the influx of Catholic immigration from Italy and Ireland in particular as a threat to their political power in a democracy. So... To be able to criminalise their behaviour, and Catholics were seen to drink more than the Protestants, and they did <laughs> drink more than the Protestants. If you criminalise their behaviour, then that's political power, that's an enforcement of political power, and that's why alcohol prohibition happened. So you've got all of these various reasons why drugs were used as a political tool to maintain public power, to, to, um, to oppress minorities, whichever those minorities are. That is what was exported around the world. I don't, it's not making sense to me on the, so on the alcohol prohibition one, what, not one example there, and on the cocaine prohibition example in America, it's not making sense to me that that would be a good tool to use for the oppression of those minorities because both alcohol and cocaine were used across the board, not just in the, like in America in the black community, and alcohol not just in the Catholic communities, they were used across the board. So you wouldn't just be criminalising Catholics or the black community, you were criminalising everyone who uses alcohol or cocaine. It depends who's making the choice of who to arrest and who to chase. I mean, the biggest backers, the biggest financial backers for the political campaign to bring in alcohol prohibition, any idea who it is? The Ku Klux Klan. It was the ultra-right wing people who hated Catholics. And there's, there's all these posters from the campaign about prohibition, and you've got the, you know, the hooded Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. Um, with these images of, of um, fighting the Papists, the Catholics, by taking away their alcohol. In the States? In the States, yeah. Why would they be against Catholics? The Ku Klux Klan hated Catholics probably more than black people. Really? They were puritanical Protestant. They were about the Protestant power base. Didn't notice. It was all about oppression. Didn't notice. It's all about political power through, through the decisions people make to use what drugs that they... they they choose to for their health, for their how they feel, how they relax, whatever it is. It's just political power. That political power, that sort of ingrained judgment, that moral judgment about other people's behaviour, that is what was exported around the world because after the Second World War, the superpower, the rich superpower, was the United States of America. And that's why we have 
the drug policy that we do today. None of our drug policy is based on science. None of our drug policy is based on uh, the relative risks or health damage caused by any of these drugs. It's not in any of the legislation. It's not in any of the foundational discussions about it. There is no evidence, no scientific evidence behind our drug policy at all. Okay. So many, so many touch points. You want to go down? I don't know. I want to go down the rabbit hole. Okay. Can we come on to you? You, you made you made an inter interesting observation, and I'm assuming it's rooted in your own experience, right? And that is that um, uh, uh, black people. So you're in the UK. Black people they're they're a percentage more likely to be arrested than white people, or or non-black people. They're more likely, they're 10 times more likely to be stopped. It varies around the country, but the yeah. average is about 10 times. 10 times more likely to be stopped searched. Yeah. Then if they're caught with drugs, they're more likely to be charged than cautioned. The white person gets a caution, black person gets charged. Why is that? Systematic racism. Now, we should unpick what that means because it's hard for people, I, it's hard for people to think, well, oh. are, are you calling me racist? Are you calling me racist? Well, you have bias. We all have biases. Biases are normal. All it's not the only, it can't be the only reason. There is some elements of racism, but if you have some elements of racism that influences a team structure or a system structure around you, and if people have ingrained biases, people can people can be in, acting on those without without even being conscious of them. But the evidence is in what's happening. So what we should do is look at the evidence and then try and unpick why that's happening. So. Ten times more likely to be stopped search. Right, let's start there. Let's start with that. That's, that's, right. that's the top of the tree, right? That's right. the top of the tree. Let's start there. So what are the reasons that that could be happening? So one is systematic. One, not the only reason. One is uh, potential for system systematic racism, right, in the force that's arresting them, right? What are the, what are the reasons? Well, I mean... Police are only a reflection of broader society. You know, we shouldn't be singling out police and, and, and having to go at them. They're trying to do the best they can in the society that they exist in. Mm -hmm. But society in a broader sense, and it's hard for most people to understand this if they're not, you know, if they're not wearing the shoes of someone who's suffering this. <clears throat> but if you spend enough time talking to people who, who suffer the casual, everyday systematic biases, then you can't, you can't deny it, really. And what's the point in denying it, anyway? You know, we want to we want to change things for the better. We should try and understand the way things are. I mean, I, rem I remember speaking to a student. I do lots of university talks, and um, I spoke to a student at Cambridge University, very bright, black guy, the only black guy there. And he says, "You know, I get I get told off. I I get my my white friends ask me, and they say, you're not carrying anything, are you? And my white friends always look after me, make sure that they're carrying the drugs, and I'm not, because they know." They're not going to get stop searched, and they know that I am. And that's the reality for a huge number of people. You know, university life, people take drugs. They do. Taking, taking drugs, altering our state of consciousness by alcohol or, or whatever other tradition, it's normal human behavior. Now, I've come a long way from, um, from being a young police officer to come to a point where I can say that that now I understand that drug, drug consumption is a normal human behaviour, which is why prohibiting it has been so catastrophic, because you're never going to stop it. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the, <laughs> the, 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 in, the systematic racism really interests me, right? And the reason being is I, I really struggle to understand in this day and age where you can have a, let's take the example of a police officer, right? Um, of a police officer, uh, that you can have a uh, police officers in general who are, who are more likely to arrest a black person than a white person in exactly the same circumstances. So same... You know, they're wearing the same thing. They've been on, on the same street. There's been the same pre. It, 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 they've been given the same information. So parallel universes. One is a black person. One is a white person. Too. I find it incredibly hard to believe that in this day and age, generally, I, and you do get 
you do still get people who hold, like you said, hold those those sort of ingrained uh, uh, subconscious biases towards black people or towards people whatever colour they happen to be biased to. I find it hard to believe that uh, that most would uh, choose to arrest a black person over a white person purely because of the skin colour of the black person. I find it really hard to believe that. And that's why I was trying to dig into, so what are the other reasons? Because if you... I, I'd like to have a look at the statistics of... My assumption is, right, I'll be, I'll be, com I'll be completely open and honest in this. And my assumption uh, on, for example, uh, the incidence of violent crime, uh, the, prevalent, um, the prevalent races involved with um, gang culture, for example the prevalent uh, um, uh, cultures involved with, uh, dr um, what do you call it, drug, the, dr the drug, the illegal drug industry, illegal drug trade. My assumption has been, and it's from anecdotal, like conversations with, I've got friends who work in London, as in, in, in with society in London, you know, things like police, things like paramedics, things, th those kind of things. And they, and they see a lot, see a lot of this. London is an example. And it sounds, and it sounds to me, and I, this is not being you being like racist. It just it sounds to me like predominantly in London, where it is a multi-ethnic place, predominantly. And this may be wrong, but my assumption is that most of the violent crime, and especially with gang culture, is off, which is often linked to drug, uh, the drug industry, right? The drug industry is uh, is non non-white people. Black people, or not, not uh, ethnic British. So you know, Eastern Bloc, uh, Eastern Bloc ethnicities. Um, that, I, that may be completely wrong, but that's my understanding of it. And and if that's the case, so if that's the case, and so if that was, if that's correct, right? If it's correct, I'm not saying it is. I really want to look inside the, uh, the browser at my on my laptop there, trying to look while you were talking, but it's going to distract me, so I'm not. If that's the case, you could have a, a city where the reason that the reason that more people who get arrested are non-white than white is because the more people committing crimes or likely to commit crimes or uh, are non-white than white. And if it's that high, and you average that out across the UK, it can skew skew the whole thing. So the whole the whole of the UK the whole of the UK appears. Yeah, we arrest more non-white people than white people, even though across the UK it's equally likely that, uh, that uh, people who are coloured compared to people who are white will commit crimes. Now, all of that is based on my anecdotal understanding of crime rates in London. I'm being completely open and honest. I'm, that's what my assumptions are formed. Pick me apart. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I told you I was looking forward to this podcast. It's going to challenge me. Go for but, it. But you see, the, the, what you've just said is that you, in one way you're identifying your own bias. So you're acknowledging that you have a bias yep. in your perception of the situation. Yep. So bias happens, works in many, many different ways. You've got that cumulative um, impression that you've got from various things, and and you know, you, tabloid newspapers will 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 shape community and societal bias. But you mentioned the cop who would stop search the black guy but not the white guy in that situation. If you were to sit them down and say you've you've made you you you've got a bias there which has actually uh, corrupted your decision making process, they more than likely they're not saying no no I haven't, I'm not racist that's not true because they're not even aware of it. So, but I don't think they would. This is the point I'm making. If the average the average person, they wouldn't do it, especially in this. this well, day no, and age. but but the, well, the thing is, the num you can't argue with the data. You can't argue with the data because there is good evidence that black people do not use or deal drugs more than white people. There's good evidence on that very good evidence although i will come to a i will contradict myself in a moment on one aspect of that so there's the evidence black people don't use more drugs they don't deal more drugs but they are massively and i mean i didn't say that by the way i'm just i'm just no no i'm telling you I'm te that i can direct you to this i can direct you to the evidence i can direct you to the studies but they are massively and i mean massively over policed on this now there is one um, social and social economic aspect, which means that there are some black kids which are drawn into uh, child exploitation where they're being exploited to deal drugs more than white kids. And the reason for that is, you've heard of county lines, kids being yeah. exploited. County lines is about when 
um, kids go from the big cities and they're dealing drugs on behalf of their their grown up masters, in various parts in the country. County lines doesn't really do justice to the scale of the problem because it's not just happening travelling outside the cities. This is happening in city centres as well. Now, which kids are exploited? Well, the kids that are most likely to be exploited are those who have been excluded from school. There is good evidence that there is systematic racism within the schooling system, which means that a black kid is three times more likely to be excluded from school than a white kid which means you've already got these multipliers coming in. So you've got the kids, if you three times more likely to be excluded, those excluded kids, which are on the street and vulnerable to exploitation, are the ones who are going to be exploited. What's the evidence for that? The evidence for the systematic racism or the, syst or the evidence for the... Evidence for the systematic racism in, in, in the educational establishments. Well, first of all, I would point you to the data of the very fact, the very fact that the black children are being excluded three times more likely than the white children. And that's, that's data which is... Which that, is that is, but but you, so in that, you can't use a... I'm sorry, I'm trying, trying not to be like no in discussion. I just, some of this, I guess, I get a little bit agitated sometimes, right? I'm trying not to be... So that, that you can't say that is evidence of, of systematic racism within it. Just that fact, it's not. That is just, that's just, a, it's just a statistic. It doesn't mean it's, it's systematic racism. It's like if you... Um, uh, I'll stop there. But you there. There are studies which back up the, the, the fact that there is systematic racism in the school. And there was one study commissioned after Child Q. Did you hear about the young girl who was... Uh, police went into the school and they put her in a, in a room and strip-searched her because of the smell of cannabis? Oh, yes. Child yes, Q. Yes, so, yes. so there's... That, there, was, that was shocking, actually. It is yes, shocking, uh, but yeah. that wouldn't happen to a white girl. And it you doesn't happen to white girls. It happens to black black kids. It does. It does. Then there is a there are studies about this, and there's been studies trying to unpick the reasoning for this. So there's something called um, a, an assumption of a more adult, um, an assumption of black kids being more streetwise, or having a more a greater adult appreciation than white kids. So there's a different view in how these children are seen in terms of the levels of vulnerability. So there are studies which look at this. So that just trying to be trying to unpick where these biases or what aspect of a bias is leading to the decision making of the events that are happening. So I there is some good understanding of it. In the child queue situation, I don't think it's fair to say it wouldn't have happened to a white person because you can't tell that, right? And and the and the reason is when I read when I read about that. So the skin color of the girl, it was a, a factor. It was, it was a, I don't know, what do you want to call it? It's one part of the whole thing, right? But when I read about what happened to, for the child, I saw that as just a real, real big failure of, of the way the, the police process and the way they went about things. Not on just the police, on the school as well. I agree. It was a, a big failure. Absolutely. But I didn't attribute it to, to race. I mean, I could quite equally see that happen to a, a, a white person. But these things don't happen proportionately to white kids. They happen to the black kids. And you know, I, I spend a lot of time with people who are researching this and, and campaigning on these, mm -hmm. these, as, these aspects. And, you know, I, the things, especially from a white person, and I, I don't, I'm aware of my own biases. And when I first started thinking about the ideas of, um, for example, when the first report came out, the Leveson inquiry and the suggestion that uh, the police were systematically racist. I was in the police and I, I was offended by this because I was not racist as a matter of principle, you know? And it's very hard from a point of even a, a position of pride, pride in the systems of our country and pride in, in, in my society. It's very difficult for me to consider the fact that we do have a problem to this extent, you know, and especially where, as a police officer, I looked around at my colleagues and I'm thinking, well, I know he's not racist. I know she isn't because we care about this shit. And well, yet, and yet there are studies about how we form our decisions based upon misconceptions and bias that we're not necessarily aware of. And, you know, well, this is why I get a bit. This is why I said I really get agitated. I don't get agitated because you've got an opposing view. I get agitated because it challenges my what I want to believe. And what I, I don't want to believe, this is really what it is, yeah. I don't want to believe that on the general balance of things within police forces around the UK, 
that skin colour is a factor, as in a, a, an influential factor uh, on its own. Because I, like, I, I believe there is a need for discrimination. Like, there's, you shouldn't have unnecessary di discrimination. I'm not talking about skin colour here, I'm just talking generally. The, the, the act of discrimination, it's needed. It's the evolutionary thing. We have to have it for survival. That's what it is, right? But I don't want to believe that someone, would, I really don't want to believe that on the balance of things, someone would arrest a black person compared to a white person in exactly the same circumstances s purely because they're black. And I'm, I'm, and people are, and I, maybe people are thinking, yeah, but what about the, the background and historical, uh, you know, that, that person's family? But I'm not talking about that. We're talking in parallel universes. These are two exactly the same people. The only difference is skin color. I don't want to believe that a black person is more likely to get arrested than the white person in exactly the same circumstances only because they're black. I don't, or, or any, anyone, never mind black, anyone of a different trait, skin color, it doesn't matter what skin color, that they would be discriminated against because of the skin color. Because, uh, you know, racism doesn't just happen against black people, it happens against all, against all races, right? I, I don't want to believe that, which is why it's challenging for me. I find it really hard to... to, to, to so um, so did I. Yeah. I, have, I have been exactly in that mindset. And it, because it was contrary to what I... It was, it was hard for me to get my head around that because it was contrary to my values even. My values and my belief in my own society... It was contrary to so many of things that I, I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to believe it. But we have to completely objectively unpick and try and understand the reason why there are 10 times more likely you, you, to be to stop searching. So, for where in the UK black. is that less likely? Because it, it can't be that high everywhere. So, where, so there are obviously going to be areas in the UK which are. Uh, if, if the you know the, this level of sy systemic racism exists, there are areas that it's less, and areas it's more. Areas where it doesn't doesn't even exist. So where is it more prevalent? Well, it's most prevalent in in, in almost entirely white counties like Somerset. It's like you're 120 times more likely to be stop search for drugs if if you're black because you I know, can understand that. I I can uh, no, I don't. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I cut you off. So I keep. I interrupted you. Go on. It's fine. Sorry. No, no, it's it's fine. Um, the, the, res, respond to the point. Feel free. No, well, that that makes sense to me. I'm not saying it's right, but it makes sense to me. In like I grew up in South Wales, right? I remember when the first non-white person moved into the village. Oh, there was two people. They were twins, and uh, and it was like everyone knew. Everyone knew. I don't know how they were treated because I I never, you know, the most I did was walk past them on the street. I don't know how they were treated. Um, I don't ever remember them being treated badly. I mean, it was it was a little South Wales village, and we weren't generally we weren't well. The Welsh should not have been being pretty bigoted anyway, but it wasn't a, you know a nightmare 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 village. And I remember when the first Muslim moved into the village, and that was a the well, point is it was, it was the talk. It was oh, you know such and such blah 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 blah. But, and I can understand how in places which are predominantly one trait, they are one thing, and when you get something different that all all of a sudden appears, it looks different. You treat it differently because you're not used to it. It's a it's like a uh, it's like a, a very it's like a ancient tribal protection thing isn't it we are this thing anything that looks different to us seems different to us that could be a threat and that's how i, I so so i'm not saying it's right i can see how in somerset it's some it's the same as uh same as if you 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 walk into a here we go talk about biases you, you walk into a room full of full of people everyone's talking and you hear a foreign accent and you hear a foreign accent maybe you hear a russian accent or a, a russian language when you're talking your brain immediately goes, hmm. and you're gonna, you're not gonna treat that person the same immediately, the same, or you're gonna, you're gonna think not to, but then you, if you're conscious of your biases, you go, you're gonna make an active effort to treat them normally. You're gonna go put it to bed. But you know, the person who isn't aware of those subconscious biases will maybe treat them differently, think about them differently. This is discrimination you just can't help. You know, in that example of the Somerset thing. But uh, yeah, it's but interesting, you, you isn't that, it? it but is you put interesting. that really well, though. You put, you put that really well. It's like you've explained my point back to me perfectly well. That, that, that these biases are 
are present in everybody to varying degrees and to varying degrees of self-awareness. So is that how you, his, So when you're talking about systemic racism, right, let's pick apart that phrase, okay, because it, it, makes, it makes the hairs on the back of people's neck stand up. Oh, it makes... When it's, I hear it, I go, oh, God. It's probably not a helpful phrase, actually. But is it, So when we're talking about a phrase... Right. Yeah. You talk, so people would maybe see that on the defensive side and think, oh, we're talking about colonialism and bringing all, you know, all that kind of, that kind of you know, historically conscious racism that is sort of still, we still got the remnants of now, perhaps. So when you talk about systemic racism, are you talking about that kind of example I've just explained? We, we've got a, a bias against people who are not of the same skin colour of people who are British. Eth eth ethnic British, right? Is that how is that how I explained it? Kind of the systemic racism thought origin. You, is that, you've ex not? you've explained unconscious bias back to me very well there, and unconscious bias is only one part of systematic racism. Though only one part. It's the biggest part, but it's a, that bias can be swayed. Consider, for example, confirmation bias. So you've got this situation where black people are 10 times more likely to be stop searched. They're more likely to be arrested. They're more likely to be charged than cautioned. They're more likely to go to prison than not when they're in court. They're more likely to get a longer prison sentence than a white person. All of these multipliers add up. But consider, if you're a custody sergeant in a police station and your cops have brought in six black people in a row, you've got com unconscious confirmation bias. You are constantly being... It's constantly being affirmed to you that the people that are your customers in that custody suite are young black men. So it, it's an accelerator. These multipliers accelerate unconscious bias and can become prejudice. Then, then when you throw into that mix some genuine racism, then that genuine racism can also steer and shape that bias around you. So, for example, I, I knew a cop... Um, I was a young man. I, d I didn't challenge it. I didn't. I didn't like my colleagues. Didn't. You knew a cop who was racist. Yeah. yeah. Oh, more than just racist. He was a dog handler, and he laughed that he trained his trained his dog to only bite bite, bite black people, or kaffirs as he called them in those colourful South African accent. Oh, was he South African? Was he? He had come from South Africa. Yeah. yeah. But but there were many. There were too many. They were a minority, but they were people put up with it and it does influence the wider mix of bias confirmation bias and the things that's going on every day and you know policing can be a bloody harsh environment it can be you can, when you have busy times you need to rely on your colleagues you're up against it your heart's pumping you've got to get to the next job you've got to get the next prisoner in it can be really really intense work and that also can int intensify a bias because if you're making decisions under pressure, then that can make your biases more acute. And I don't think we should judge for that. That's normal. <laughs> it's normal human behaviour. But what we should do is be objective and unpick it and see how we can make things better. Hmm. How are the police dealing with this? Well, at the moment, they're just being attacked for it, aren't they? Institutions aren't necessarily unpicking it very well. And, you know, it, almost on a weekly basis at the moment, the police are being criticised for misogyny, racism. One of the problems at the moment, though, is that anything anything that happens to... Any situation that happens to a... No, I'll rephrase that. There were was, there was certain, certain examples of arrest the situations in which a black person's involved and they've been arrested rightly or wrongly and they're thrown up in fact every single one that gets thrown up are thrown up as examples of institutional because that's the common phrase institutional racism I mean quite often it's not which aggravates the situation I think yeah absolutely but these things are only happening because there is a problem and that problem will play out in the media in various ways and you're right sometimes it's not just sometimes it's not correct but it's only symptomatic of the ad, of a problem that does actually exist. And, you know, complaining about one instance or another, I mean, we need to just sit back and, and take notice of this. Now, obviously, at the start of this, I made the point that I'm a, 
as, at your invitation to explain being an activist. I'm a single issue <laughs> activist, and what you've done is teased out of me how my activism overlaps into broader issues, because, and and the institutional racism is one reason why I campaign on drug policy, but it's not the primary one. The primary one is to reduce the power of organised crime, but. You can't look at drug policy without looking at every aspect. And the reason drug policy um, makes this, this institutional racism much much worse, much more difficult, is because you, know, you can claim, and some people do claim and prove, that the criminal justice system in its broadest sense, right across the board, is racist. Yeah, okay, it is. But it's much more so for drugs. It's much more so. Because if you're inviting cops... It, it, a cop goes to a burglary and they know they've got to catch the burglar, yeah? They look at the evidence for who committed that burglary and they try and find out who it is. Mm. That's following evidence and that evidence may take you to a white person, it may take you to a black person, but you're following the evidence, yeah? I'm describing this in very simple terms, but it's a useful comparison. If you're asking a cop to go out and find some drug dealers, then the first thing he's tapping into in his decision-making process is the bias. Who are those other people? Who are those people who do that? And the bias is at the beginning of that investigation. It's at the beginning of that system, of that, of that decision-making process. But are police resources not thrown at where they know they can get results from the crime? No. Well, it depends what you describe as results. And this is the biggest con of our drug laws. Um, and I think you might find this fascinating. I, I was sorry. I didn't mean just drugs. I mean, I, I was general. I meant in general. Well, talking about drugs does answer that question okay, okay. because if um, if the police investigate a a burglary, and if a burglar is caught, then crime will go down because there is a limited number of people in a society and a community that is willing to and able to commit that burglary. Yep. So if you catch one, burglaries are likely to go down. If you catch a drug dealer, crime will go up because there is an unlimited number of people who are willing to commit that crime to make that money because you're talking about an enormous marketplace. You're talking about supply and demand. And what happens, as particularly in an urban area, if you catch one drug dealer, that opens up an opportunity in that marketplace for two or more people to take up that opportunity that you've created in the marketplace. And those two people will fight sometimes, quite often, over that opportunity. So the net effect of drugs policing, drugs arrests, is that violence goes up. Now that's not something that the public generally understands, but it, it forms part of police criminal intelligence databases that violence goes up so in terms of effectiveness and putting resources to what is effective there is a massive contradiction because drugs policing does not reduce crime ever it more likely increases it it also increases corruption so there is a massive disconnect with the resources and there is massive there's massive resources put into drug put into drugs policing with no tangible benefit at all and here's the greatest con the public con of drug prohibition we've we all see the images of <coughs> drug drug seizures we are all collectively as a public invited to celebrate when the royal navy sees multiple tons of drugs or when our local police catch a find a huge cannabis factory or there's hay bale sized blocks of cocaine have been seized or blocks of heroin they, they talk about it being the biggest drug seizure since the last one and how they've kept these drugs off the streets well this is an incredible con because and it's an incredible con where we are being manipulated with marketing because we see these images and they're repeated images all the time on social media or in the news these images of the drug seizures and what we're taught as a general public is wow Look at the good job they've done. Look at that massive pile of drugs. That means that that's successful. They're having success. That means the current policy works. That's the subtext. That's the way we're reinsured. The public are reminded there's something to be scared of. 
and then they're reassured that the police are doing something about it. And so the public are conned into believing that our current drug policy is worthwhile. But the reality is that those drug seizures leave, with, leave a wake of increased violence and the changing shape of the drug market means that over time there is an increase in corruption. Now, if the public, if these things were explained to the public, I don't think the public would support our current drug policy for very long. But it's not the fault of the police because the police have a duty to maintain public confidence. That's a basic instruction from the Home Office to a chief constable. You must maintain public confidence. <coughs> Because if the public lose confidence in the street, in the police, then obviously that causes problem for the fabric of our democracy. But this is this huge contradiction. That because the police are not being honest about the actual impact of drugs policing, <coughs> the public aren't informed. So there's, there's this systematic con going on where the public are not told the truth about the matter. Would you like me to explain to you what I mean by increasing corruption? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so you have two things. And this, this is interesting because you'll, you'll hear a senior cop um, talk publicly when they have this big drug seizure or a load of arrest. They say, we have, we have a duty to and we have managed to disrupt organised crime, drugs organised crime. And you'll like this, because that word disrupt, the lexicon of using the word disrupt, actually comes from an army officer's manual. When army, the, an army officer's manual talks about uh, disrupting an insurgency. That the way that you deal with an insurgency is you disrupt them, you disrupt their activity. So, this word disrupt has come into police command lexicon. So the police are treating drug dealers as an insurgency. And they're seeing the way to deal with them as to disrupt their activity. But the trouble is, they're not an insurgency. They're just part of a massive marketplace. And if you listen to business academics talk about how to create market growth, they talk about disrupting the market. The way you create market growth is to disrupt the market because then you create opportunities. And through those opportunities, you get create market growth, which is exactly what's happening with the drug market. But you've got senior cops, unironically, declaring that they're going to disrupt this market. So there's some confusion going on there. But what happens with that disruption is the increased violence, which I've already talked about, but you also got an increase in <coughs> corruption. And the reason for that is when you get a couple of steps away from the street, so you, get, you reach the people who are actually making some real money from the drug markets. If you arrest some kingpin character or gang which is making a lot of money that controls say the heroin in um in one city in the uk you've created an opportunity now the gang or kingpin character or whoever it is that is most able to take up that opportunity because they have the resources to do so is someone who controls the supply in another city a neighboring city so what you've done by removing one player is you've allowed another player to expand their share of the market. And by increasing their share of the market, they've increased their disposable income. And organised crime will always invest their disposable income in corruption. Because in doing so, that, that's an essential part of the business model. If you can corrupt the system, the criminal justice system, officials, police then you are making yourself safer. You're protecting yourself. Less risk. Less risk, exactly. You're making yourself more efficient as well. And you're also making yourself more able to get rid of other competition because organised crime uses the police to get rid of competitors as well. So over time, we've created these powerful monopolies. Not always monopolies. Sometimes they're cooperatives. And one of the most notable cooperatives that's, that's been formed in the last few years was announced by the National Crime Agency just less than two years ago, where they announced, and why they announced this publicly, I'm still puzzled by, but they did. They announced that the organised crime groups in the UK and the Netherlands had formed an alliance with the Italian Mafia. And traditionally, these two groups are, were at, <coughs> at odds with each other, competitors, but now they're working cooperatively, which means they're, they're sharing their corrupt assets 
They're sharing their supply routes and reducing their risks by working collectively together. This happens at every level all over the world, all over the world. Look at Mexico, for example. There used to be 20 cartels in Mexico. Now there are only three. And, each, and those three cartels have a bigger GDP than most West African countries. And they've used that power to completely corrupt those West African countries. So you've got narco states like Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Senegal. They're not legitimate government anymore. They're run by, international, by transnational organised crime. This is the growing corruption that international drug prohibition is causing. And it's accelerated by the attempt to police the drugs markets. We are not having any benefit, any tangible success or benefit from policing drugs. We are only accelerating this journey towards the growing power of organised crime. It's worrying, isn't it? Because, uh, because it isn't only a benefit to... See, see, the drug prohibition isn't only a benefit to cr criminals, and whether, whether it's serious organised crime or not, but it's also a benefit to legitimate organisations who benefit from, being, from people being immuno, not immunocompromised, ill, from being sick from being mentally compromised, physically compromised, because of the because of drug use, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. We're, we're criminalising people. We're not taking care of them. Uh, you're criminalising people. You've pushed them to the fringes and they're not likely to ask for help. And they don't ask for help because they've been marginalised. So, yeah, it's not just benefit, benefiting criminals. It's undermining society's ability to look after the most vulnerable in those societies. Bear in mind, 90% of drug use is non-problematic doesn't matter what the drug. It's non-problematic. The 10% of people who use drugs which, which wear it for, which, for who it is problematic, it's a sliding scale. For some people, they need more, some intervention. For some people, they need a really extreme intervention. The people who are using the drugs really most problematically is because they're traumatised. And we have very clear evidence of this. People who have PTSD or other mental health issues, they've got childhood trauma... People who use heroin problematically, two-thirds of them are self-medicating for childhood trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, or neglect. That's an enormous percentage of people who are in emotional pain from what happened to them as children, and all we do as society is we judge them, we criminalise them. Uh, Self-medicating is a bit of a, uh, a misleading term in that case, though, right? They haven't chosen to go, I think I'll have heroin to get over my issues, have they? They've just they've been gatewayed into, not been gatewayed. They've found their way to heroin. They, th so they've been self-medicating drugs, drug starting off with whatever, and they've ended up on heroin now. That, that's yeah, because self-medicating sounds like a conscious choice. To, well, I'd have met loads of heroin consumers. The only drug they'd had before was alcohol, and they went straight to heroin. Um, but I'll give you one example: a woman called th who who street name was Uma in Northampton when I was working undercover. And she said to me, oh, I can stop using brown. I can stop using heroin. And I do quite often to bring my tolerance down. Trouble is, when I've been off it for a couple of weeks, then I, was, then I become suicidal. Uh, because then I remember the feeling of my uncle's fingernails when he was sexually abusing me as a little girl. So for her, it was a very rational decision to stay on heroin because it emotionally it blocked out that emotional pain and those memories. And it kept her alive. So things are not always what they seem. And if you see someone who is using heroin problematically, your first question is, should be, I wonder what happened to you. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sorry, my mind's been on some stats I pulled up earlier while you were talking. And it was the ethnic breakdown of in the UK. So you were talking about Black people are more likely to be arrested. To, but a figure of ten to one across the UK. Sorry to pull this back. No, that's fine. It's fine. So te, to ten to one. So if that figure is to be believed, which it is, because you're saying it, I trust you. The so the the so in the UK, black people make up around about eighteen percent of the UK, which makes that figure even more staggering. In in terms of the ten to one, because you're not talking about 
black people are more likely to be arrested ten to one, and they're equal. Oh, I didn't ever think they were they were equal uh, equal in terms of population in the UK, but they are only what 15, 18 percent, and in London they're like thirteen percent, or well, maybe the other way around. Anyway, the point I'm making is that is fucking staggering, because it is that just that alone there, those two stats alone are indicative of an issue, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. You know, um, come, coming forward again. Onto the, onto the. Sorry, I had to bounce back there. It was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was not frustrating me. It was bothering me that that you know the, the, my only assumptions earlier on, and then I wanted to look at what it was. But on the drug, on the drug prohib- prohibition, can we? So, what are you advocating for in terms of drug policies now? I'm. First of all, it's important for me to say this is not just say, me saying this. I am part of an international organisation of police and other law enforcement figures who campaign on the same issue for the same reasons. How big and is the organisation? We are big already and growing rapidly. So it started in the United States. We are the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. I'm on the board of the organisation in the United States. I'm also chair of the organisation in law and, and Europe and the UK. We're growing across Europe. We just got loads of new members in Spain, in the Netherlands, uh, Germany's, uh, Germ- the German leap was um, instrumental in bringing about the legal cannabis market in Germany, which is about to happen. They were campaigning on that. Oh. We've just had huge amounts of press in, in France. We're making great inroads there. We've got huge membership in Norway. We're growing across the world. Australia, I, I've done, I've spoken to cops, but even where they're not members, the, the movement of police who want to take power away from criminals is growing rapidly. You know, I've spoken to cops from South Africa, uh, Latin America, all over the world, who want to stop this growing power of organised crime. And the way to stop that power is to take control, and we need to take control of this. I'm not some left. I'm not some lefty lawyer advocating for this. I'm still seeing this from the position of a police officer. I want to fight criminals. I want to stop their power. And the only way you can do that is to take their market away from them. So you need to legally regulate (coughs) all of the drug markets. And you need to do it according to the evidence and according to the relative risk of each drug. So, for example, heroin, it is the most risky. So it would be incredibly strict. We can go back to the British system. If we prescribe heroin to those people um, who have a problem with heroin, we would no longer have a heroin problem. And there is good example, there's good evidence of that. In Switzerland, in 1994, they started prescribing heroin to any problematic consumer who needed it. Their burglaries have dropped by 50%. They don't, they no longer have street sex work in Switzerland. They don't have a heroin problem. They don't have heroin, a heroin death problem at all. Their, their heroin consumption has dropped Massively, and you know the frustrating thing is they used British evidence to do that. So I'm a I'm a heroin user in Switzerland, and or I'm a heroin user. You in the UK, for example, in the future in the future UK that Neil Woods and Co and Leap have campaigned and managed to get. I'm a heroin user. Uh, I'm hooked on it for I'm hooked on it because I got hooked on it before it became legal. I was getting it illegally. Uh, how do I so how do I qualify to go and get heroin from the pharmacy or prescribed from the doctor? Depends on the system. This one of the one of the structured systems they have in the in Switzerland is you go to a clinic three times a day. It can be negotiated later on that you take it take it away from the clinic once you get a job or something like that. But you, what the normal pattern of things that happens is that when someone goes into that clinic system, they're allowed to take as much as they want. It's not that it's the discussion with the doctor prescribing doctor. And if they want to increase the amount of heroin that they take each day, they can, because they're in control of it. But they pay um, for it? No. No, it's completely free. It's the benefit of society. But what normally happens in almost every case is the patient increases the amount of heroin that they, they use for, for around six weeks. And at the six-week mark, when they've had six weeks where they're not spending their every day trying to find the money trying to hustle their way to their next fix and they've got time in their life for more things they've got space in their life because their life has been stabilized at the six week mark they start bringing it down themselves and that happens in almost every case and so see so in in that situation then 
So I was my question was going to be, well, how does that stop people using heroin? Because they can get going get access to it, right? So, <laughs> well, so because because criminalizing heroin is the ultimate pyramid selling scheme. Because organized crime exploit people who are using it problematically. They encourage them to use more. They encourage them to use it more problematically. And they encourage them to find more customers. And that's what happened as the ground zero. When the British system ended at the end of the 1960s and the heroin market was given to organized crime. Before that happened, there were 1,046 heroin consumers in the UK at the end of the British system, and the number was falling. In less than 15 years, we had 300,000. 300,000 heroin users. There's a very clear cause and effect there. The market was given to organised crime, and there is an incentive to find no customers. Did Switzerland have much of a heroin problem before, before they legalised it? They had a massive problem. It was a regular news story about public parks in Zurich where people were injecting publicly. And there were so many people doing it, there was no way of even policing it. They had the worst heroin problem in Europe. What happens to the criminals? What happens to the criminals who are doing the crimes, pushing the drugs, making that money, when that mark is taken away? I love that question. And whenever I have an audience with police in the, in the, in the audience, that's the first question that gets asked. Well, they, it was actually a police officer who asked me to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. I, I, kn I knew it because it is what comes to your mind as a police officer because I'm, I'm a cop. I just still want to catch criminals. But the point is, it just reduces crime. Crime goes down. Like I said, in Switzerland, their burglaries are the, one of the, the lowest in Europe now. And they were the highest. I suppose, but, is it like when there's less opportunity to make money from crime, then your mind starts looking elsewhere? And the elsewhere is legal ways of making money, right? In the same way, yeah, exactly, when the heroin exactly addict that. hasn't got the ability to, uh, hasn't got, has got, hasn't got to spend time on trying to find the money for the next fix. They spend the time on things that aren't looking for the next fix, which are inherently better things than looking for the next fix. Right? Exactly, you've explained that incredibly well, in really well. Looking at it from a criminology <laughs> point of view, crime's not actually caused by criminals; it's caused by opportunity. And so, if you take and, and I know some of my colleagues, policing colleagues, will have the view, well, they will have this view, they will have this view that criminals are criminals and will always just find something criminal to do. And there's a sort of almost a world-weary... I don't believe that. No, I don't. But there is an element of policing that will be inclined towards that view because cops have seen so many criminals doing criminal shit, yeah? So it will taint that view. And, and I can understand that. I can understand that. You can have people who are who will forever be more inclined to take up criminal opportunities. Yeah. But it doesn't mean they can't get away from that. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, you, you put that really well. Um, Stop complimenting me. That's three times in one podcast. Normally I'm mincing my words. But, but, it, it, but it, fits, <laughs> it fits the discussion so well. There's a, there's a, I, I, sh I would encourage anyone to read a brilliant book by a criminal, criminologist called Tom Gash. It's called Criminal, The Reason Why People Do Bad Things. And it is... Essentially, it trashes the opposing political views because there's two predominant political views about why the, about a response to crime. One is the right wing that a deterrent is the way to stop people, yeah, and the other is the left wing that it's all social economic that poverty and inequality causes it. And this book <clears throat> trashes both of those views that it's not social economic. There's no reason why poor people are more inclined to commit crimes than rich people. There isn't. Not according to the best evidence. There's a slight element, you know, there's some elements to that. But the deterrent thing, the deterrent thing doesn't work. It certainly doesn't work for drugs. I would say that there is absolutely, it is absolutely true that poor people are more likely to commit crime than not poor people. Absolutely. If you're starving and you need to put food on the table, you're more likely well, to... Well, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a range, isn't it? So the poorer you get, the less the less you have what you need or what you want. And so the more, more likely you are to do things that aren't legal to get that. And, it, and it's a sliding scale. And the further down towards poverty you get, the more likely you are to commit crime. And, f and further up the way, the less likely you are to commit it because you've got more to lose and you've got less you need because you can buy more. 
the the differences are not quite as you as you would expect though because the the conclusion of this book is and I honestly I would encourage you to read it. it's a brilliant book Greg Thrush it's uh, Tom, Thrush, Tom, Gash. Tom Tom Gash Tom, Tom Gash. Gash and I'll because the, the conclusion is what you've just said is that actually crime is about opportunity and one of the best examples in the book is uh, in the 1980s in Germany there was an epidemic of motorcycle thefts <clears throat> and it was it's getting an, a bit of a national crisis because it was it was becoming a situation where no insurance company would, with the insurance companies were threatening to completely withdraw from the German market and say, we can't insure anyone who has a motorcycle because it's going to get stolen. We can't cover it. So people were struggling to spending huge amounts of money on it. And it was a specifically German issue. It was far, far worse than anywhere else. It was a political issue. <clears throat> anyway, there was a policy change for a completely unconnected part of the of the policy regime, which overnight changed things. And that was, in Germany, <clears throat> they caught up with some of the rest of Europe and decided that for safety reasons, anyone wearing a motorbike, riding a motorbike, should wear a helmet. And the motorcycle thefts almost disappeared overnight. They reduced 90% overnight. Hmm. And that's because <laughs> if you have to carry around a motorcycle <laughs> helmet <laughs> as preparation for what essentially is an opportunist was had become an opportunistic crime, then you don't bother doing it because the opportunity has changed. That's just one example of of, of, of well, yeah, how crime it rules out a whole a whole a whole like cross section of people who are less who don't have the opportunity to do it, and those are the people who can't get access to a motorcycle helmet. <laughs> this is basic as that, right? Ex exactly. Can't afford one, can't steal one, don't have one. So that's it, yeah. I mean, it's completely logical yeah. once, once yeah, that, yeah, yeah, once yeah, that yeah, piece yeah. of history is yeah. explained. Yeah. However, no one saw it coming. No. No one saw it coming. So to understand crime, we need to understand that, it, for the most part, it's about opportunity. So to the cop who says, and then there are many of my <laughs> colleagues out there who will say, no, 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 he's a criminal. He's going to go and do some more criminal things. All of the criminal opportunities are already being taken up. We do not create new opportunities for crime by removing some opportunities for crime. We don't. And by taking control of the drug markets, taking that value, taking that, taking that um, wealth away from organised crime, you cripple them. You cripple them. Now, again, cops will say, yeah, but what about all the other stuff organised crime do? Organised crime are always going to be there. Yeah, of course. Now that Pandora's box has opened, organised crime are always going to exist. However, by a very long way, the biggest wealth for organised crime is from the illicit drugs market. By a long, long way. And and actually, it's that wealth which, which allows them to commit other crimes. So if you look at the strategic assessments from the National Crime Agency, which they publish periodically. On more than one occasion, they've made the point in those strategic assessments into organised crime that the wealth from the illicit drug markets are reinvested into other forms of criminality. Reinvested. Now, we all know if we're going to start a business, we need capital, right? You've got to have a start-up. The value in the illicit drug markets allows other crimes to happen. It's the bank for those other criminal activities. So not only do we cripple organised crime by taking by taking their biggest money spinner away from them, we also cripple their ability to commit other kinds of crime. And that includes people smuggling. That includes counterfeiting. Because the investment for those other activities come from the drug market. Mm. So if we want to take organised crime on, the starting point, the starting point is to legally regulate drugs. And yeah, I know... Drugs are always going to be a problem. We're always going to have policy. We're always going to have to be thinking the best way to deal with them because they can be they can be problematic, right? But as the priorities need to be protecting our children, removing access, reducing as much as possible our children's access to these drugs, and also for those that do choose to take them to make them as safe as possible so less people die. Those two simple priorities are not catered for in the current policy regime because it is easier for our children to get hold of cannabis and MDMA and cocaine than it is alcohol or tobacco. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. And that's not good enough. And people are dying now 
from our current drug policy that don't need to die. MDMA, for example. MDMA is incredibly safe if it's in a regulated dose and you know exactly what's in it. But people die from MDMA. There's no reason for people to be dying from MDMA, for yeah. example. This is one of the misconceptions people have about when you when you talk about... Le you know this, I'm preaching to the converted, but when you talk about... Uh, when you hear it, the the thought we should legalise we should legalise drugs, people think what people think is we should make drugs freely available to anyone and everyone who wants them, which absolutely isn't the case. To your point, one of the advantages because again, I was not we talked about this off air, I was not on the legalised drugs um, attitude. In fact, one of the attitudes I've had in the past is several times said in this podcast, make alcohol illegal. Like literally one of the things I said in the past. I read your book and it and I completely changed my view and everything. And the reason be, uh, to explain. So legalizing drugs means, to your point, MDMA become it comes off the street. It means that people who need access to it or want access to it, they are they can get access to it. It's a little bit more difficult, it's a little bit harder, a few more steps, hoops to jump through. Um, but it ensures that the people who um the people who shouldn't have access to it, young children, the vulnerable can't get access to it right the people who do get access to it know exactly what they're getting for example there's no risk of overdose what they're getting is controlled it's controlled doses it's manufactured professionally and they're not getting it you made a really good point you made earlier which i, I didn't pick it up in your book I, you must have mentioned it in there but they're not getting it from someone who's trying to give them more because the person they're getting it from is not making money from it and they've got their interest in health uh they've got their health as their interest, right? Really good point about it. It's the same with cannabis. I mean, uh, where they've started legalizing America, obviously, is one of the main ones. Holland, I mean, the, uh, Portugal as well, legalized drug trade, no? No, no, I they, thought they, they had. They've decriminalized the possession of drugs, so no one gets criminalized for using or possessing drugs, but they haven't taken control of the market, which is a, you know, you shouldn't criminalize people for using drugs, but it they need ah. to be, but the criminals are still in charge. They're halfway there, but not all the way. Yeah. yeah got it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm totally, you know, I'm completely sold on it. I'm completely sold on it. I understand all. I understand all the benefits of it. And uh, we need to do it right, though, because there's examples where they've really not done it very well in America. Go on. They've made it too commercial. They've made it more about making money than they have about people's health. Um, and the, are you talking we, about cannabis? In specific? Can, cannabis in particular. Yeah. So what's wrong with the way they're doing it then? Well, the way I, the way I would do it is completely with a public health focus. So I wouldn't I wouldn't allow advertising. Um, I would have pricing different differentials for the different strengths. For example, but cannabis is a bit different to the rest of the drugs, though. Would you not agree? It's the hardest to regulate because anyone can grow it. Um, but it's the less impact. I it's, mean, well, it's, the, it's, it's, one, it's it's one of the healthiest. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's and it and it is and it is healthy in most cases, right? I mean, for many people, it's good for them. And it's a treatment and a medicine. Yeah, it's a medicine as well for various treatments. So that's yeah. why it's very different to the rest of them. So, I mean, so, so There's a lot going on there, yeah, <laughs> definitely. But I, another, one of the problems with some of the, the way that the American states have done it is they've not done it with social equity. So they've allowed just rich, rich businesses to come in, capture the market, and then the people who have been going to prison for selling it they're still criminalised. They've still got criminal records. Yeah, they dropped that's the ball not, on that one, didn't they? That's not. But yeah, some some have some it. have done it right. New York State, Washington State, um, they have they have done it by expunging people's criminal convictions, providing grants yeah. for people who are marginalised to actually yeah. get into the business. I've got no issue with them commercialising the cannabis trade whatsoever. Zero. Just because I see I see cannabis as being a more as in literally a a health. A healthy thing for people to have, predominantly, as opposed to unhealthy. You know, like a, I see it as a, you go into Holland and Barrett and you pick up, you you flipping vitamins and minerals. I literally see it like that. However, as, uh, there are some people it doesn't work for, like anything. Same as alcohol, like anything, right? There are some people who become alcoholics who drink alcohol. The, the, the most people don't. Um, so I can understand whether to commercialise the cannabis side of things. I see the I even see the benefits of commercialising it as well, but because it but for the rest of the drugs, I wouldn't work. Like they, I, I mean, in, in the same way with alcohol, it just wouldn't work. It just has to be super regulated, not commercialized. What did you say? Like, what, how did you say to do it uh, with? Um, Stop. No, no branding and advertising. No brand and advertising. Yeah, and uh, I mean, for, for me, even with cannabis, yeah. I don't want to be encouraging 
young people to start early. No, I agree. Because it's young people's brains that really yeah. need to be staying away yeah. from cannabis. Agree. Yeah. And the commercialization and the, some of the style of advertising that they have in places like California is just not appropriate. Okay. And there's good evidence that it's not appropriate because it encourages young people to seek it yeah, out. Yeah, I totally ha agree. Having said that, though, there is good evidence now that in every single state of America, apart from Alaska, don't know what's going on there, every single state in the, where they've legalized, legally regulated, child consumption has gone down. So there is clear proof that legal regulation protects children better than prohibition. Like very, very clear proof. Mm -hmm. Same in Canada. But I just think we can go further. We can we can have stricter regulation. And but the thing is, we've only we can only start even having that conversation once we've taken control with legal regulation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like I said, I'm completely sold on on uh, on in inverted commas legalizing drugs 100. percent but to your point, it needs to be gone about in in the right way and, and really and like really careful analysis of how other countries have done it, what they've got right, what they've got wrong, and um, and it's not an overnight thing. I mean, you know, this is a, a long process to get through it, and it's not just about changing the laws and the rules and the regulations, and it's also about changing the public perception of it and the, uh, the public opinion of it. Mm. You know, um, but uh, I agree, it's the right thing to do. Like totally do. I've got some. We're getting towards. We're getting towards. Yeah, I've got some questions. Right, mm -hmm. that I had from people. Uh, one I've already asked you, which was from a policeman who shall not be named, and uh, and there are some others from my patrons. One second. I think we've covered them off, right? But let me just remind myself on these because if we haven't, I'm going to ask you anyway. And if we haven't, I'm going to ask you. So, questions. I guess here we go. Excuse me. I want to scroll back through. Uh, oh man. Uh, so. I'm going to read this out loud because I can't, I can't, okay. So, uh. Oh man, I got back to the top, sorry. Okay, with cocaine now seen as the recreational drug of choice, can you foresee this being reclassified as Class B, and if there are any benefits of doing this? This is obviously near term. Yeah, cocaine is now the second most used illicit drug in the UK. What's the first? Cannabis. cannabis yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 huge. It's huge. It's everywhere, and I suspect it's actually <coughs> being used more than even the statistics suggest. Really? I think I think it's I think it's ubiquitous, uh, and I think it's growing. And the supply is, is massive. I mean, it's now not unusual to get almost completely pure, even small one gram deals of cocaine. The price has dropped. The purity has gone up. The price has dropped? Price has dropped. Relative price has dropped massively for cocaine, yeah. What is it now? Well, I mean, if you talk about the, the purity, because the purity used to be 30 40%, now it's in the 90s quite often um, for the same price or less. You know, that that's a massive, massive difference. So what are you paying for a gram? Not you. I mean, what would people, someone pay for a gram at the moment? For example, in London, it varies more than it's ever done. Um, Sixty is your average. People are paying as low as forty or as high as ninety if they believe the hype that they're getting the best quality. So there's a two-tiered market break happening with different types of quality. Um, but the the difference in the pricing is the fact that more often than not, you're getting a very very pure product, mm. which is peculiar and all down the west coast of the states it's like why is that almost about? almost all of the deals that are being seized are 100 percent. How, how is that coming about just a glut of supply from where from uh, latin america there's um venezuela's being uh gone into cocaine production uh it used to be just the three countries venezuela didn't even used to feature and it's just the failure of law enforcement and the the process that i've described but Moving between the classes makes no impact at all. Um, it might take, if you've moved it to class B, it might take some of the violence out of the market because if you reduce the threat of the prison sentence, violence go violence does go down. There is some, uh, some evidence of that. What class is it at the minute? It's class A. Can you, can, can you see it being reclassified to class B? No. Not, not no. saying you, sh you, you, do you think it should, but can you see it being reclassified? I can't see that happening, no. I mean, what should happen is it should be legally regulated to control the supply. Okay. Uh, from the same person again, so Gav, Gavin Tuak. Uh, should it, and he's been on you on the podcast twice, and he's got a, he spoke about the second podcast. I know he's on about 
uh, he's finally me talking about it. He's got a brother uh, who has had all sorts of pro- life problems for, uh, from drug addiction and other things and has done jail time. Uh, so it's a, a subject very close to his heart. So here's uh, another question from, from Gov. Should it become law that those released from prison for drugs offences are not returned to the areas where the drug-related crimes took place? Those returned to the same areas again are again targeted by drug dealers, etc., and then back into the same routine as before. I don't think that should be law, no. I think that should be law that those people are have wraparound care from society, that they have all the counselling and support that they need. They have they should have automatically housing first housing first approach that they're looked after with housing, they're looked after with support structures and not criminalised. But of course I have to come back to the core point is that those people, those worst elements in our society, can only exploit that person coming out of prison because drugs are illegal. That's the only reason. Yeah. Uh, okay. Some prisons only house sex offenders. He's just he's responding to something I said. Wouldn't it make sense to have drug offence crimes, stroke, those seeking a way out, to be within one establishment, a bit like a rehab? Evidence that reoffending costs the UK taxpayer millions per year. So should drug offenders be housed in the same place? Drug offenders, well... For possession, drug offence crimes, Sorry, drug offence crimes. crimes, drug offence crimes. Well, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be going to prison at all. No one should be going. To, no one should be criminalised or imprisoned for what they choose to do with their own mind and body. No one, um, because if that if that is not hurting anybody else, then it's just about their own mind and body. Now, I, I know I've come a long, long way from a cop who cared about security more than personal liberty, but now. Having gone through all this journey and explored all the the reasons for drug law reform, I can't help coming down to the fact that this is about individual liberty as well. So no one should be criminalised for that. So they shouldn't be going to prison at all. And again, I reiterate that those people going to prison for drug dealing are only criminalised because the the market is illegal. That this is this this entire system of criminalising people and this merry-go-round that we have of arresting arresting drug users and drug dealers all of the resources that it sucks in only happens because we've made these commodities illegal and we can change that we can take control yeah agree i'm just checking through any more of his questions uh blah 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 blah, 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 blah. don't think don't think there are any more there although i did have one on WhatsApp. Uh, with the legalization of drugs, he would support. It's from a good friend, Stevie Broom. Uh, how do we make the cleanest, safest drugs available? Do we make it a competitive market like we do with alcohol? And how would you qualify to purchase certain drugs? For example, a schizophrenic shouldn't be able to purchase any psilocybin product, as an example. Yeah, I mean, how commercial and who makes the drugs? I don't really mind. There's some people within my movement, uh, within the drug law reform movement, would want government-controlled labs and only the government producing these things. I don't see that as a necessity, really. Government's about the regulatory control. And if you have uh, competitive labs making these things, as long as they're doing it according to government regulation, that's fine. It's, it's much like the pharmaceutical industry. As long as you can prove you're producing the right drug in the right way, in the right quantity, and the right delivery method, and the right packaging, with the right messages, the right advice, then you're fitting into the regulatory requirements. So how commercial it is doesn't particularly bother me as long as um, advertising and marketing doesn't influence people's decisions to take those drugs. That's the important thing. We've got enough uh, marketing and um, influencing people to take drugs from the criminal market now. One of the reasons to take control is to remove that coercion and influence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We are nearly out of time. Uh, Right. How this podcast came about because one, Keith Abrams, uh, over at Heroic Hearts UK, who's been on the podcast before, and uh, so you must know Grace Bless Hopley as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, connected us up. I read your book, completely flipped my opinion of drug legalization on its head. 
and now you've sat here. So the book, Drug Wars, explain to people what it is and where they can get it. So which book did you read? Good Drug Cop, Wars. Drug Wars, yeah. right, okay. Um, oh, no, hang on. Because Good Cop, Bad I, War is my memoir. I must have read them both, did I? And then Drug Wars is the history book. The... I read Good Cop. Right. Go on. So to explain the books while I'm reminding myself. Yeah, so I read good, both good cop, bad war is is my memoir. It's the stories from me working undercover, um, various near death experiences. You know the kind of thing. Um, but those are the those are the my personal experiences which brought me to the conclusions that I have. Drug wars is the additional evidence. It's um, stories from the UK and evidence from the UK through our history, which which backs up, I suppose, the conclusions. About, about corruption and um, how our current drug laws are corroding society. So I've not read Drug Wars. I read Good Cop, Bad... Good Cop, Bad War. Good Cop, Bad War. I read that. That's what flipped my, that's what flipped my opinion. And I need to read Drug Wars. I thought it was Drug Wars that I'd read. Okay. And you're, uh, it's Amazon and Kindle and all the rest of it, right? Yeah, the, all the usual, usual all people. The usual. Yeah. And uh, how can people find out more about the Law Enforcement Action Partnership? Well, um, in the United States, the, they have the website and they're a huge organization there. Um, or you can follow, um, we're just redoing the website, but I think you can still find um, at ukleap.org. And then there's Leap Europe website, which you can find by searching. Or you can follow us on all the social media, um, at ukleap on Twitter. You'll find me connected to UK Leap as well, um, one way or another, on Twitter. Um, and how do people pick your brains if they want to pick your brains? If it's a short question, Twitter <laughs> some, Twitter's sometimes a good um, a good a good way of doing that. But if they want to email me, you can find me on my website, which is neilwoods.net. Perfect. And if anyone wants to book me for speaking venues, things like that, um, I'm particularly keen on reaching useful audiences to win over. Define useful audiences to win over. People, um, people who are not natural allies of what they consider to be something that's too liberal, because this is not about being liberal. This is about taking control. So, um, centre right audiences, um, I like to spend my time with. Really, um, you know, some some of our best allies are some some members of the Conservative Party, like the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, or an MP called Dan Poulter, or you've got Crispin Blunt. They're just the people who can... There are various groups of people that we have to win over to these arguments, and there are just different parts of the, of the, of the argument appeal to different sections. And maybe the discussion that we had wasn't the best... The best um, the, the the way we started this today, covering the aspects of uh, racial disparity, you know, that wouldn't be the natural way I would go. Uh, first. I don't. I don't. I'm, well, I'm going to disagree with you because it's my own podcast, and I think it's perfect. No, I'm joking. No, I, I I will disagree, and the reason I disagree is because, right, uh, we did mention we were talking to myself here as well. We, we're similar in that we like to challenge ourselves. Like mm. I didn't read Good Cop, Bad War because I thought, yeah, let's legalize drugs. I didn't. I read it, one, because you were on a podcast, and two, because I knew it didn't align with what I think. Yeah. And I want to understand, I want to understand, one, uh, generally, I want to understand why I think what I think, and I want to understand what the other side think. And I want to understand what the other side think, because maybe there's information that I am not privy to, and I want to know that information, because it helps inform my view about anything, about climate change, about systematic racism in the UK, about drug change uh, about drug policy changes right so i it, it is good that, that was uncomfortable for me doing that part of the podcast by the way because again it can it really challenge what i think and it is <laughs> it's definitely made an impact on me um and talking about all that and uh and uh no so it's the perfect way to go about it like i, I one of the things that frustrates me in today's world is that people are unwilling to try and understand why they think what they think Right, <laughs> and they're unwilling to try and understand why people who don't think what they think think what they think, it's, and it's 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 crucial. 
it's crucial to form new opinions. If someone was if someone was to ask me, um, why do you believe uh, that drugs should be legalized, and, and my answer was, well, I just think they do it because, uh, well, because because it's it's personal freedom, mate, isn't it, or wh- whatever. If that was my answer, that that would horrify me. And there are things about me where I can't answer in depth. And when I identify one of those, I try and understand why. Like I was having a conversation with someone about climate change the other day. And they are, and and they were challenging my opinion why I thought what I thought, and I couldn't answer in depth about a p- specific aspect. I was like, shit. I went home that evening and I read up on that specific aspect, trying to understand, do, right? Do I think the right thing? Because I couldn't explain what I I couldn't explain why I had that opinion, which is bad because it might be the wrong opinion. I went up and read it. Next day, I understood. Okay, got it. People don't do it. So conversations like this, whether you know, whether you obviously like left of centre, at the very least. Would you describe that? Are you suffering that? Depends on the topic, to be honest. Um, Great point. Great point, yeah. Depends on the topic. Yeah. And uh, and same with myself. I'm, I, I'd i say I'm left of centre. But some things, I'm way right. Other things, I'm way left. You know, it's a spectrum for everyone, isn't it? Mm. That's really important. So no, I, I, I'm very conscious. I didn't realise that you don't do podcasts anymore. So really glad we could make this work because I've learned a lot today. And I think listeners have uh, had a lot to inform their own opinions too. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I'm still going to do them. I've just taken a break because I was doing too many and, and I've just taken a break. But I did this one because Keith Abrams introduced me and I've got a massive amount of respect for what Keith does and Heroic Hearts do. So a big shout out to them. Um, if anyone hasn't listened to his interview or looked them up, they, they really should. Um, because it's the new frontier. You know, psych- we didn't talk about psychedelics today, but psychedelics really are the new frontier for so many reasons. And not least of which, so for those of us who are suffering from PTSD, because I, I do have chronic PTSD. And I know a lot of my, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of the, some of the Leap UK membership have PTSD way worse than me. A friend of mine who's a member of Leap UK, another former undercover cop, very similar experiences to me, exactly the same journey, exactly the same conclusions. He can't leave his house. He's got a support dog to look after him for when he goes into disassociation. He's in a he's he's, he's in a drastically ill way. And there's an epidemic, there's a mental health crisis, and this is another problem of drug policy that our drug laws are stopping us objectively dealing with a mental health crisis. So there's, big yeah. shout out to Keith yeah. and, and what he does. Yeah, there's drugs there that can be used to treat people for all different ailments. I mean, MDMA been an example, psilocybin been an example. All exactly, those, yeah. all those. exactly. And, and the the research and the treatment isn't able to take, go forward because they're fucking illegal. Exactly. Yeah. Neil, it's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure. And um, you are welcome back here anytime you want to try and make you feel uncomfortable. I uh, see the chair will be free. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's been fabulous meeting you and talking with you. Good luck with everything. Good luck, and I hope it comes off. That's it. Thank you for watching the H-Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here, around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear, if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast, on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not-so-common podcast apps you can also if you wish to do it become a patron of h hour becoming a patron of h hour you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else so this interview with this guest was released days if not weeks before it was on release to the general public and you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews which i do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they're only released to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. 
In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away give away gifts to my patron supporters, and it's all like well, predominantly veteran owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran owned apparel, veteran owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events, so you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Hey Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash hk podcast some spelling patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n patreon.com forward slash hk podcasts hit become a patron and uh, i'll see you on the next zoom Q- zoom q a if you do oh you also get your name in the credits thanks for watching i will catch you next time